Hi comrades, Ewers KVS. The next class for the postal assistant examination is going to be presented in this episode. Please go through the video minutely again and again and prepare yourself for the examination in a neat and effective manner. Thank you very much, sir. So welcome all to the second class of the PO guide part one. So in the last class, uh, we were uh, discussing about only one class. That is very that is the very first class, which is about the control and the organization structure of the department. So in the first class, we have explained in detail. So in this class, the second class, we are going to continue with the other classes, other other important phrases of the PO guide part one. And now let us see about the next class uh, of the PO guide part one. So now we are going to begin with this night post offices NPOs. This is very, very important, um, uh, an important topic in the examination point of view. You cannot find any, it is very rare to find a question paper without this uh, a question in the night post office. Now we are going to look about the same. So night post offices. So generally, this night post offices uh, were designed to meet uh, the customer's requirements even after the working hours of, the, of an office. So this working hours of, of a night post offices will generally be fixed by the head of the circle. So question will be like, who will be fixing the working hours of an NPO? It will be fixed by the head of the circle. That is nothing but the chief postmaster general. And also a night post office, the timing of a night post offices will generally be up to 7 p.m. Up to 7 p.m. And this uh, time may be extended up to 8.30 p.m. only by the director general of post. So I repeat, generally the working hours will be fixed by the head of the circle. Whereas this extension of working hours of, of an uh, NPO will be uh, fixed uh, by the director general of post. And so in order to extend this 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And also in order to keep them open on uh, Sundays, uh, the permission, uh, the extension will be granted only by the Director General. Please do not forget. And during this extended hours, that is from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., not all the transaction of an NPO will take place. So during these extended hours, only some transaction will take place, like booking of registered articles, um, including VP articles, and booking of EMO, and they can sell IPOs, the postal orders, and post it stuff. Uh, during from this 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And uh, during this extended hours, there will be no deposits in savings bank account schemes. And um, cash certificates like this KVP NFC will also be available only up to 7 p.m. on weekdays only. So during these extended hours, something will happen and somebody will not happen. Uh, we can book from 7 to 8.30 p.m. registered articles including BP. EMO booking will be there. IPOs will be sold. And postage stamps will, be, will also be sold. What will not happen during these extended hours? There will be no deposit in SB accounts and no cash certificates after this 7 p.m. And, and one thing to remember normally NPOs will function up to 7 p.m. I told, during the working days. But even if the DG grant permission to uh, function this NPO, uh, even in Sundays and everything, in Sundays and postal holidays, uh, this uh, uh, working hours of NPO will be restricted uh, for only one shift that is from 10 to 17 hours, that is up to 5 p.m. So I repeat, in Sundays and postal holidays, if the DG permit to uh, function the NPO, it will be working only for one shift, that too from 10 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m. And during these Sundays and postal holidays, the delivery function will be entirely suspended and there will be no payment of money orders and no saving bank works. So don't get confused. During regular working days, uh, in the extended working hours, something will, uh, some uh, actions will be performed and something will not be there. And during Sundays and holidays, it will function only up to 17 hours. And during Sundays and holidays, no delivery, no money order payment and no savings bank work. So this is very, very important point in examination point of view. This is the night post office. And the next point is all about the mobile post office. The mobile post offices was designed by the department in order to provide facility for lay posting 
in the cities at different times. Some cities will be, uh, the need will be there, like even after working us, we, we need some facilities. For that uh, point, we have mobile post offices. So these mobile post offices are designed to meet the postal requirements of some new settlements in the area and also to provide late evening booking facility to the public. So the mobile post offices will be moving across the city and they will be having scheduled to stop the mobile post office at some particular place and they will be receiving uh, ordinary postal letters for dispatch and also booking some things. And even if the mobile post office is working beyond the working hours and late hours, these mobile post offices will be closed on Sundays and postal holidays. So the only post offices that will be functioning even in Sundays and postal holidays is only the night post offices. Please do remember. So these mobile post offices will be closed on Sundays and holidays. And the mobile post offices will be selling stamps and postal stationeries. They will book uh, registered articles excluding insured and VP. Very important point. They can book articles but not the insured and VP. And uh, they'll, they can sell stamp, postal stationeries, book articles except insured and VP, and air parcels, apart from accepting the unregistered articles for dispatch. At present, uh, Chennai and Nagpur, um, uh, some uh, places will be having mobile post offices, and uh, Madras and Nagpur mobile post offices are even more authorized and permitted to book money orders also. So generally, mobile post offices um, will be selling stamps and stationeries, book articles apart from insurance VP and air parcels. They will not be functioning on Sundays and postal holidays. So this is all about the mobile post offices. The next very important thing which we are going to discuss is business hours. What is the business hour of an post offices? So generally for all the post offices across the nation, across the department, will be having, will be following a uniform business hours. Uh, which will be as follows. So generally, for the reference and inquiries and uh, for selling the postage stamp and stationeries, the business hours is entire working hours of the post offices. So during the entire working hours of an office, uh, they'll be doing reference inquiries. They'll be attending inquiries. They can sell postage stamp and stationery. So stamps, stationeries, inquiries, and reference will be carried out throughout the working hours. And the next is, Booking of registered insured, including VP articles, will be carried out for up to six to seven hours uh, in the working hours. And on Saturday, it will be restricted to five hours. So for booking of registered insured, um, the working business hours is six to seven hours. And on Saturday, it will be for restricted to five hours. And um, not only for booking, even for window delivery of registered insured and VP articles, and payment of money orders, the same the same business hours will be followed. That is six to seven hours, and on Saturday five hours. And apart from this, booking of money orders, uh, postal orders, uh, savings bank, and savings certificate works will be carried out for five hours in general during the working days, and for three hours during the Saturday. So for uh, financial related transactions like IPOs, money orders, and savings bank works. Five hours normally, and on Saturday three hours. And branch post offices will be general. Uh, it will be working for a minimum of four hours and a maximum of five hours. So these are the important business hours of a post offices. So the reference inquiries in ten hours for booking and a window delivery of some articles six to seven hours, and on Saturday five hours. And for financially related transactions like money orders, IPOs, and savings bank and certificates for five hours and, and on Saturdays, it will be for only for about three hours. Branch offices, minimum four hours and maximum five hours. This is also another important uh, point in examination. And uh, the next the next uh, thing is all about what are all the business that will be done on Sundays and postal holidays. So as I already told, except the night post office, all the post offices will remain closed on Sundays and holidays. During these Sundays and holidays, there will be no clearance of letter boxes and no delivery on such days, as you all know. And also, uh, there will be one more office working on Sundays and holidays, that is our railway mail service. So, uh, during the Sundays and holidays, we can post letters uh, in the letter boxes of RMS, uh, but only 
on paying that uh, prescribed late fee for that article. So normally, late fee is um, actually for unregistered article, it is rupees two, and for the registered article, it is rupees three. So posting of letters on these Sundays in RMS will be uh, done with a proper paying of late fee. So uh, such posting on Sundays and holidays can also be made in the letter boxes of the mail vans of the RMS section two. And uh, most importantly, machine fanned articles, which you are going to discuss about the franking machine in detail in the later session. These machine franked articles should not be posted either in the postal letter box or on the mail van letter box. And also, one more thing: the registered newspapers and book packets, which are accepted on Sundays and postal holidays, without any payment of late fee, that is uh, two rupees or three rupees in press sorting offices. Uh, that is press sorting offices is an office which is being located in the press in order to collect uh, the registered newspapers which is being delivered by them. so in press sorting offices will be collecting registered newspaper and book packets without any payment of uh, late fee in sundays and postal holidays so these are all the functions which will be done on sundays and po holidays so the next point is all about po holidays uh, about holidays of an post office generally Post offices will be having 17 holidays. So how many postal holidays? Question, very important point. We will be having 17 post office holidays in total. Out of these 17 holidays, three will be national holidays. As you all know, the three national holidays, that is on August 15, January 26, and on October 2nd. So these three holidays are common throughout the department. And these are the national holidays. And... Uh, out of these 17, three is national holidays. And we have uh, 11 holidays as common postal holidays, which are common throughout the nation as religious holidays. So 17, we have three holidays as national and 11 as common postal holidays. And one more three are optional holidays. These three holidays will vary from circle to circle based upon their religious, their religious uh, uh, festivals and everything. These three are optional holidays. And the circle can decide these three optional holidays. The three optional holidays will generally be decided by the circle by constituting and state coordinating committee. Uh, this committee will com will comprise once uh, will uh, they will be meeting once in a year in order to decide the three optional holidays, which will be uh, benefiting for all these circle employees, state government, uh, central government employees. So I repeat, there are seventeen holidays. And out of these 17, 3 will be national, 11 will be common, common, and, and uh, 3 will be optional. So 11 plus 3 plus 3. So we will be having 17 holidays in total. This is also another important point in examination point of view. And the next thing which we are going to discuss in payment in uh, PO Guide Part 1 is how to pay a postage for, a, for an article. So in what ways you can... Uh, pay a postage to an article. So we can pay postage to a postal article by three ways. One is through postage stamp. The other is through franking, machine franking. And the third is through prepayment of postage by cash. I repeat, stamp, franking and postage. And uh, cash, prepayment of cash. So firstly, we can discuss about the postage. As we all know, uh, we have postage stamp being printed by the post office under the direct authority of government of India. So in India, uh, we have we have uh, two uh, printing press. One is Indian Security Press located in Nasik, and the other is Security Printing Press located in Hyderabad. And uh, apart from these postage stamp, department will also be selling uh, revenue stamps, um, uh, which is not which cannot be used as a postage. And these revenue stamps will be sold in the Department of Post on commission basis. And also, uh, we, we are having philately. Philately is nothing but the hobby of collecting postage stamps now. This philately, we have philately bureau at all the principal post offices. So, as on 31 March 2019, at present, we have 84 philately bureaus across the nation. And uh, we, have, we also have overseas philately uh, orders. Which, which will be executed only by the Mumbai GPO. And uh, the minimum amount for such uh, overseas philatelic account is 1,000 rupees. And for domestic PDA, domestic philatelic deposit account is only 200. So we have discussed about the first one, 
which is nothing but the postage. Postage is the thing. And the next class we are going to discuss is about the spoil or defaced stamps and fictitious stamps. So, so what, uh, what in the class, in this class, they are explaining like that. So, nobody should not use any, any obliterated or any defaced or any torn stamps or any cut stamps or like that. They cannot use it as a stamp and it cannot be recognized at any cost as a payment of postage. And uh, uh, a special registration envelopes, there will be some special registration envelopes dedicated only for the purpose of the registered articles. So these special registration envelopes should not be used for the transmission of unregistered postal articles. So anybody, if anything is found, any postage stamp is found to be um, found to be uh, uh, duplicate or any fictitious postage stamp is found to be uh, circulated for the postage, it is definitely an offensive one under the Indian Penal Code. So the using of used postage stamp is also an offense under Indian Penal Code. And the manufacture and use of any false stamps or any fictitious stamps is also an offense punishable under Section 263A of Indian Penal Code. This is one important point. So question will be like, uh, under what section these, these usage of false postage stamps will be punished? So we have to... Uh, select the section under section 263A of Indian Penal Code. And uh, uh, reproduction of stamps is allowed only for the philatelic publication and not for others. So used postage stamp is also an offensive one under this act. And the man manufacture and use of fictitious use of postage stamps is also an offense punishable under section 263A of Indian Penal Code. So spoiled or defaced stamp, used stamp, a false stamp should not be used for the postage, for the sake of postage. And the next thing, very important thing, which we are going to say is about franking. Yet another important point in examination point of view. So franking, franking, what is franking? Well, franking is nothing but it is a method of stamping used for the postage. Uh, we'll be having franking machine. So bulk articles will be, uh, will be franking those articles. And we will be having a franking impression with a, designated postage so at present the department which we use the franking method which we use we call it as rmfm that is the remotely managed franking system which is being kept in force with effect from 16 8 2010 so this rmfm frank impression will be generally in bright blue color so this will be in blue blue color earlier we had electronic EFM, there is electronic franking machine, uh, which impression we had it in red color, but now frank impression will be in blue color. So the next important point, who will be issuing license for this franking machine? Generally, individual and commercial license uh, for this franking machine will be granted by divisional head. So the licensing authority for individual and commercial licenses, divisional head, and for the government departmental licenses, regional head. So very important point. Who is the licensing authority for individual and commercial license? The divisional head. And for government departmental, the licensing authority is regional head. So this is a sample of a franking machine. So in a franking machine, we'll be having all kind of uh, details like uh, what class of article it is, whether it is a bill mail service or a registered post or which class of article do it belong. And also we'll be having the date of posting. As you see in the picture, we'll be having some the date of posting and, and um, importantly, the country name and what is the postage paid for this article and uh, users license identification number. Upon proper uh, generation of license, the user will be having some user license identification number. In this picture, you're seeing new uh, yen uh, starting with yen yen means new post we have only two uh, franking machine uh, we have uh, only two manufacturers in for our india that is one is pitney bows and new post so yen means new post p means pitney bows and we'll be having a 2d barcode which will be um, having each and every important point about that article and we have pin code of the posting office and the date of posting so all such information will be there in a frank uh, impression and the next thing this rmfm the impressions as i already told it will be in blue, blue color impressions will be, will have a combined single or a 2d barcode and uh, 
there is an automatic credit process will be there and earlier used electronic franking machines will be in red color and will be having like value die and license type like that you know and uh, one more thing this rmfm actually this was introduced in the um, in the year 2010 actually this rmfm is made introduced on 16 8 but only from 17 2013 um, we passed an order like that only the article which has been franked through this dg frank plus machines will be accepted and no other articles from any any other efm or a private franking machines will not be accepted from 17 2000 so there is a difference between introduced on 2010 but this rmfm has been made effective from 17 2013 so what are all the salient features of this rmfm so this generates a 2d barcode the barcode can be scanned to check the genuineness of any frank impression and this will be containing the class of article the authentication code date of franking and mail number frank value and uh, uh, each and every manufacturer will be maintaining their own central server Uh, will be they will be having some remotely managed franking server in india so each and every machine will be calling the server at least once in 30 days the otherwise the machine will be get blocked they will start functioning only after dialing to the server and next important thing is what will the licensing fee for this rmfm the licensing fee for a remotely managed franking system is rupees 375 for 7 years and renewal should be and the period for this uh, uh, 375 is 5 years and even before the one month before the expiry the same has to be renewed if the same is not re uh, renewed within 2 months after expiry a penalty of rupees 100 rupees will be charged from the licensee the customer after 3 months there will be no renewal after expiry and they have to apply for the license afresh once again i repeat license fee is very important the license fee is rupees 375 for 5 years even before the one month of the expiry the user has to renew the same if the same is not renewed within 2 months after expiry will be collecting 100 rupees as a penalty and after 3 months after the expiry there will be no renewal and they have to apply the uh, uh, license afresh and how they can recharge the customers can recharge for this rmfm through any e payment method in any sub or head post offices the first recharge will be will should be of minimum 2000 rupees and subsequent uh, amount will be of rupees 1000 and multiples of 100 so recharge can be done across any post office counter or through even india post web so normally generally the license will be granted to the customer within 14 working days and renewal within 5 working days if not renewed if not renewed the fee will be refunded within 30 working days by the department so this is all about licensing fee and recharge that to be made to the rmfm so while posting so while posting while well, posting these rmfm articles the licensee or his messenger should produce a window delivery ticket uh, window delivery ticket is nothing but like an id card issued to the rmfm manufacturer rmfm licensee so this window delivery ticket will be produced while posting the articles so the post office will uh, is now maintaining two registers that is one is office record book which will recording all these uh, frank records uh, of the office and the other one is daily docket register daily docket register is uh, what are all the daily franking that they do in that machine will be recorded in the daily docket registers so rmf articles shall be posted generally posted at only one office that uh, to which office which which it is designated but uh, earlier efm articles can be posted at not more than two offices so an rm a franked article can be posted of maximum three times a day and what is the benefit that the customer gets through this franking so generally the customer will be getting a commission of 3% Uh, is permitted on the value of franking machine and also a customer can uh, frank up to any value there is no maximum limit the customer can frank an article up to any maximum limit and 3% will be the commission of of the overall franking machine and additional 2% will be given 
for the customer those who present the articles in pre sorted bundles so generally there will be there is threshold limit 5000 so there is a threshold limit so maximum uh, commission is uh, for about 5000 so generally 3 3% and additional 2% on pre sorted but this should be below this threshold limit that is rupees 5000 so this rmf server of each and every manufacturer will call this dop server at least thrice a day to exchange the data between this funds depositor since this is an automate this is an automated machine whatever the um, whatever the amount which is being deposited will get reflected in the very next day so this credit will automatically be uploaded when the franking machine calls the connected rmf server um and the meters will be reset automatically so this is an automated machine so as i already told from 17 2013 only the machine franked articles through rmfm system are accepted from a private franking uh, franking users and no more um, other franking like emfm is allowed and license fee as i told 375 for 5 years renewal one month before otherwise penalty of 100 and the same thing is like that so this is this is all about the franking machine very important point examination point of view and the third method is above for about pre payment of postage in cash so generally uh, the head of the circle may authorize uh, some um, customers for a pre payment of postage that is the customer will be depositing a fixed uh, deposit in the post offices and the customer can post any article uh, there and it will be deducted from there at once like that so a head of the circle may authorize to realize any postage charges in cash from the firms or any other person who post at least a minimum of 500 packets at a time in big cities and 215 in small towns so this facility is also available at selected gazetted and hst post offices or business establishment who post not less than 500 articles at a time so now we have seen about three types of postage that is only one one through postage stamp the second through franking and the third through prepayment of postage stamps so this is all about the uh, the three methods of postage so the next thing which we are going to see is about packing procedure uh, how to pack an article uh, so this is briefly mentioned in the pivo guide even pivo guide there is this there is special mention how to pack some kind of liquid substance and how to pack in perfume that is a uh, liquefied uh, articles like that so this class deals about general packing procedures so as we all know each and every liter or a packet or a parcel has to be uh, generally it will be dealt with date stamps in the in both the office of posting and also the office of delivery and is liable to a great deal of pressure and friction during a transit so all the articles therefore um, which are likely to suffer from this stamping pressure should be packed in such a strong covers such a strong uh, durable covers so the post office it will not take any special precautions uh, to secure the safety of any fragile articles so each and every packet or letter or a parcel it should be packed in such a strong cover and it, and it should not give rise to any sharp edges at the end so this is the general packing procedures which has been mentioned in the po guide part one so the next is about sealing so sealing is uh, it has been mentioned not to use sealing wax for seals outside the unregistered letters or packets except when such seals are absolutely necessary for such protection so generally not to seal anything unless and until it is absolutely need, uh, needly compulsory this is the next thing and the next clause is about the posting of coins so generally coins uh, bullions precious stones jewelries and uh, articles made of gold silver or any currency um, that is to be sent by inland post should definitely be insured so we can send these kind of coins articles gold or silver only through insured post so to what amount it can be insured to the maximum ceiling limit so the maximum insurance amount for currency notes is rupees 20000 and the maximum insurance amount for uh, jewelries and precious item articles is of about rupees 1 lakh this is also very important thing for how much value a currency 
uh, notes being can be insured. So it is twenty thousand. And for how much a jewelry can be insured? It is for about one lakh. So this is about posting of coins. So next is about letter boxes. So letter boxes. So the next class deals with the letter boxes. So all the letters, postcards, inland inland letter cards and packets may be posted in the letter boxes in the post offices or mail offices, provided that the postage due and the late fee, if any required, are fully prepaid. So what is the thing which is telling in the clause? This is all the letters should be posted in the letter box after prepaying it fully. After only fully prepaid article should be posted in the letter box. This is the this is the thing in this clause, and the next clause deals with the usage of the minimum number of postage stamps. So, one should use only the minimum number of stamps. So, usage of large, very large quantity of low value stamps should be minimized, uh, because which will take up some unnecessary, which will take up some unnecessary and unwanted space in the address portion. So, uh, we can we should use only the minimum number of stamps. And uh, avoid using low value stamps, which may take up some unwanted space. The next clause de deals with the posting in special letter boxes. So the letter boxes, which is meant for uh, posting only the letters, should be used only for posting letters and postcards. So no other kind of any second class article, like any registered uh, uh, book packets like that, it should not be posted in this. Special letter box. So the letter boxes, which is particularly meant for post only the letter, should be used only for posting only the letters and postcards. Apart from this, the special letter boxes provided in the cities for posting air mail articles and QMS. QMS is nothing but quick mail service. Can be used only for posting such class of articles. So other articles, if, if in case if it is posted in such special boxes they are definitely being liable to det detention it will be detained for some days and then they'll transmit the same through rms so qms service is nothing but a uh, quick mail service so quick mail service uh, will be in uh, major cities like chennai mumbai kolkata so the articles which has been port posted in quick mail service <coughs> will be transmitted uh, transmitted quick and the uh, fast, uh, um, apart from the normal postal articles. So QMS articles, the condition for QMS articles is that the article should be at the full pin code below the name and town of the destination. So this is the clause which has been mentioned about posting of some special letter boxes. The next thing, large articles and other letters. So because of owing to their size, if some articles cannot be posted in the letter box, uh, they they may uh, give the articles by hand mm -hmm. at the window of a um, mobile van or the post office is provided, provided that the postage and the late fee for that articles are fully prepared. So only because of the size, if it cannot be posted in the letter box, we can give hand hand it over the same to the concerned post office in person to in to the counter. And the next thing, articles requiring special treatment so letters and articles should be clearly mentioned and marked as registered or insured for so and so rupees and value payable for rupees etc on the top of the address area of the cover in order to differentiate and uh, uh, the normal class articles from the uh, these kind of articles the the class of the articles like registered insured or value payable should be mentioned at the top of the address side of the cover air mail articles uh, which is which bearing high value postage stamp may be presented at the counters and stamp should be defaced in the presence of person so some air mail articles may be having some high value stamps postage stamp so those articles need not be posted in the letter box and they can be presented at the counter and the stamps can be defaced in presence of the person so this is these are the these are some articles which require some special treatment. And the next class is all about desirability of posting early. So generally, the public are advised since this BO, BO guide part one is uh, like all the instructions uh, which has been intended to the public. So in this class, they are telling that uh, public are advised to post their mails and letters as and when they are ready without waiting for this last claim. So 
as and when the letter gets ready they can come and post in the letter box and they need not wait until the last clearance so this is what mentioned in this clause and the next clause is all about manner of affixing postage stamp how to affix a postage stamp so as we know the stamp should always be affixed to the right hand top corner of the address side so there will be some space left uh, above the address portion which can be used for the stamps and in the right hand top corner of the address side this is the manner of affixing postage stamps next one next clause is all about non postal stamps charity stamps labels seals etc so this is one other important point so the labels stamps seals or any other markings or which is generally not postage but something which appear to be postage should not be attached and they should not be impressed or defaced or anything else so i repeat the labels and stamps which uh, the charity stamps sometimes charity stamps will be there there in order to raise donation for some some for some general cause so such um, uh, charity stamps or any other labels which appear to be postage stamp but generally not the postage stamp should not be attached or impressed and impressions which are likely to be mistaken for impressions of a uh, franking machine must also not to be made on the address side some impression will 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 seem to be like franking impression so those kind of uh, any impression should not be uh, placed in the address side and only clear postage stamp that to uh, large value postage stamp should be affixed on the right hand top corner of the address and the next class deals about this method of addressing how to address how to address what are all the things that need to be mentioned in the method of addressing so generally the address should be complete and definite it should be very complete along with all the pin code and it should be definite enough to ensure uh, a very easy transmission and delivery without any inquiry so always address should be written in the lower half on the right hand side so generally an envelope can be divided into four portions so a stamp should generally be affixed in the right hand top side whereas address portion should be on the right hand the lower half the lower bottom there should be address so the address should be written in the lower half and towards the right hand side of the front of the article leaving a clear margin of at least 3 cm top uh, for the postage for affixing postage stamps the post stamp should be noted in block letters and it should it should it should also be underlined and below the post on the pin code of the post on should be noted in detail and uh, it is it is also desirable to note the sender's address in the lower left hand corner so the lower left is for sender's address uh, right side bottom is for address side and the right side top portion is for postage stamps so sometimes the con concession rates of postage or any free postage like that like book post or blind literature packet should be clearly noted on the top side of the address side of the articles so any kind of any specific kind of article should be mentioned at the top of the article so this is all about method of addressing and the next thing articles bearing indefinite addresses so um, as i already told no article will be delivered unless and until it bears a definite and complete address no article will be delivered uh, unless it bears definite address articles addressed in a general way like a, a, a not, not in, in in specific way articles addressed in a general way or uh, any names without complete name some uh, may be containing only the surname or the family name or any fictitious or false name or any conventional marks of any kind will not be delivered will definitely not be delivered only complete custom complete addressee's name with complete and definite address will only be delivered parcels or any other articles and money order will not be accepted unless they are definitely addressed to a particular person or a firm in the office of delivery if it is found that there is no post no post box Uh, we are going to discuss in detail about the post, post box in the next class but in in a office of delivery if it is found that there is no post box in that name or uh, the address e has been ceased to be an enter of the postal box such kind of articles will be directly returned to the sender so generally 
these kind of indefinite addresses uh, it will be very difficult to carry out and will be directly written to the sender so this is all about this clause so with this clause i'm ending up this this session and will be uh, will be discussing uh, the remaining clauses in the uh, in the upcoming classes thank you all thank you so much comrades i hope you would have enjoyed this program what are all the organization and what are all the rulings provided in the guide you have gone through everything please go through once again it is in the youtube channel only uhs kvs youtube channel only you can go through once again you read well again and again so that everything you can grasp very easily and you can write the examination very effectively please don't forget to subscribe the youtube channel uhs kvs if you subscribe this channel naturally you will get the notification as and when we are making the posting fresh posting not only for the classes but also the latest developments taken place in the department and also the orders and everything you will definitely be benefited and so don't fail to subscribe the youtube channel with this we are concluding we will see you again thank you very much meet again comrades uhs kvs